Hey, everybody. Can you guys hear me? How are you doing today? My name is Carlo Apoglesi. I'm with IBM. I've uh, been with IBM for two years now. I'm a big data, data science evangelist. Um, and, and prior to coming to IBM, I was director of innovation for a company, so I bought a lot of products. And from, I, was, I was in your shoes. I was a client. And um, I, did, I dealt with a lot of emerging technologies and trends and, and really how to kind of embrace some of this technology to drive some new innovation and um, new business opportunities. So today I'm going to talk to you about the future of data science. Um, so, you know, it would be, uh, uh, I'd like, I'd love it to be more interactive. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, but I'll start by really kicking it off and asking how many people here consider themselves a data scientist? So, okay, good. We got some handful of people. Hopefully by the end of this, you guys will all think you're data scientists. But we'll see. Um, so first, you know, start out kind of the drivers of what's going on. It, you know, the digital, digital age has really changed how everybody lives, how they play, how they learn, and how they work. So everything you do now is, is driven a lot by digital, whether it's your mobile phone, shopping, everything's changed. So this is kind of a lot of the driver of why, uh, you know, your company is required to really make a shift to a data-driven organization, because uh, everything that is being done is really digitally, and it's driven by the data that's on those applications. You know, I always talk about, my kids are old now, they're like 22 and 19, and um, when they were young, I used to just you know, talk to them. Now, if they're in the other room, or they're even across the house, I can't even communicate with them unless I text them. So if I, if I actually yell their name, they won't hear me. They have headphones on or something. So if I text them, they actually will respond right away. So now I, I actually, the way I communicate with my kids requires digital device, which I really don't like. But, but it, it's just kind of the way, world we live in, and, um, and, and your business really needs to be aware of that. Transformation is critical. Uh, there was a recent Harvard review done, and a Harvard study, and it said 72% of all companies are vulnerable to disruption within three years because of this digital transformation. Uh, and for companies to compete, you really must shift to a data-driven business. That's probably why you guys are all here at Hadoop Summit, so I'm probably preaching to the choir, but just really, it's very important, and you know, wanted to review that. So why we're all vulnerable to seismic shift? You know, there's, there's several impacts to this. You know, we have internal threats. This is siloed data gaps you know, in our expertise and skills. There's a lot of skills gaps in, in a lot of companies. And, you know, and, and we're unable to react quickly to the, the demands of the business. I can tell you this much, prior to coming to IBM, um, you know, I was the guy that was driving a lot of the requests to our IT department our developers and in you know our dash you know our bi teams i remember once buying a company a mobile company we paid a half a million dollars or something i can't remember what it was a few people came along with it we acquired the company we started to put it out in the field to see how it would do and um, then i go to my bi team and i'm like hey i need a dashboard to monitor the success of this this business unit that we bought and they came back with an estimate of a million dollars okay so i bought a company for half a million dollars and I got to spend a million dollars to build a dashboard, that don't work. So uh, the time we live in has really changed in, the, in those internal threats of unable to being able to adapt and, and deal with things quickly are a big problem. Then, of course, the external threats. This is what everybody talks about, the Ubers. These are companies that are born on digital. They're born and built on technology. Two guys in a the garage, they write some software, they, they revolutionize the industry. And next thing you know, you have competition from everywhere. So these are the threats. And um, actually, I forgot to mention, uh, 274,000 estimated worldwide startups each day. That's, that's, I don't know where that number came from, but that seems really high. So I, uh, I think that threats are everywhere. So uh, unleashing your data and making the shift to a data-driven organization is important. And, this is what we call our value maturity model. Uh, it really talks about how, um, based on how you implement your data, uh, really uh, the value that you get out of it. So for operations, 
to automate operations, you're not going to get a lot of value, but you gain efficiency. Um, when you start to go into data warehousing and reporting, you, you, this is more modernization of your, of your ability for your company to respond. Data, you know, self-service analytics really makes you a data decision business. It allows you to, uh, uh, your, your, your internal employees to make decisions quickly and to adapt because you actually allow them to have self-service to their data. And then the new business models. And this is where data science really comes in. This is where you're really transforming your business, where you're putting uh, your models and your proprietary data on the edge device that your customers are interacting with. Uh, these are, this is where really everybody wants to be. You don't have to follow this model. I really am a big believer in just pick one use case and build it all the way on the new side and see how it goes um, versus trying to you know, do everything all at once and then things will come along. So this talk is really about data science. So I was thinking to myself, and I put a lot of this material the last few days together, um, so, so I was like, well, what is, you know, what is data science? Everybody, we were all talking about it. So I went out and got the definition off of Wikipedia. And, and you know, data science is a concept to unify statistics, data analytics, and related methods in order to understand and analyze an, an actual phenomenon with data. Well, that doesn't say that I have to be a PhD. It doesn't say I have to be a mathematician. You know, it just says that I'm using some mathematical concepts with data. To, to solve a problem or, or do something. So in my opinion, we've all been doing data science work for a long time. And, and to me, data science right now is really just a data scientist is a buzzword. So I'm gonna go into a little bit about what is a data scientist, what makes it up. And, that, and the reason I put that there is kind of just to, you know, to say that a data scientist is not some defined thing. It's really something that uh, is growing based on demand need of solving problems with, with, with uh, data and uh, analytics and mathematics. So what makes a, a data scientist? There's really three core skills that make up a data scientist. There's domain expertise. This is really understanding your domain, whether it's a uh, supply chain or your financials. It's, it's that domain expertise. This is the mathematical side, which is you know, the, 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 what you're applying to that data. And then computer science. This is the technology really behind applying that. There's no one guy that really can do all of it. And if you, if you, you exist, ask for a raise. Or if you're looking for a job, come talk to me. <laughs> but yeah, nobody really, the whole point of this is that nobody exists that can do all these things. And um, it's, it's, um, it's really a kind of a combination of multiple skills. And this is why data scientists, when you hire them, are usually well-educated, they've been around a while, they, you know, they're harder to find because it requires a lot of skills together. The, the real work kind of happens in the overlap areas. So if you look at the overlap between computer science and domain expertise, this is where you build engineering projects. This is software development projects. Between computer science and math, this is the machine learning element. And then uh, if you go domain expertise into math, this is where a lot of the research happens. Um, so, so a lot of data science work is kind of happening in these overlap areas. And you kind of understand a little bit of, of, of um, what's going on. Data science, because of these multiple skills, data science is really a team sport. Uh, th this means it requires multiple personas within your organization, multiple you know, people to, to implement these projects. The data scientist is critical to really apply these new techniques, new methods, machine learning, and so on. The data engineers are important because you know, they have that data access. The application developers are the ones that are implementing on your edge nodes. And then the business analyst is really kind of the one that understands your business domain. So it, data science is definitely a team sport. And at IBM, we really have kind of incorporated this into our platforms to understand this so that we can cater to the different users based on their skill sets. Steps it really takes to put data science to work. Um, I, I think a lot of you probably know this, but you, you have to articulate that use case, which is really where the business analyst comes in. Then gathering all that data, this is where your data engineers really play a lot. Prepping the data is also data engineer across with data scientists. Applying machine learning or data science techniques is really where the data scientist kind of uh, does its job. And then the evaluation is also monitored throughout by the business analysts and data scientists. And then 
the digital application implemented, that's where your developer comes in. So these are the standard steps to uh, putting uh, a data science project out there and putting it into work. But as you can see, machine learning is really a, a big part of you know, data science today, especially when you're talking about implementing with your digital applications. So what is machine learning? Uh, you know, I, some of this might be review for some of you guys, but uh, you know, it, it's where computers that learn without being explicitly programmed, basically you're using algorithms to understand patterns and data. So this is really the, 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 the idea that you take a known algorithm that's been around a long time, like Nave Baines and other ones that have been proven for certain purposes, and then you apply your proprietary data to build a new model for prediction and insights. You know, so that's really what machine learning is all about. It's not explicitly programmed. Um, my background's really in development, but it's learned. But once you get to start you know, building models of machine learning, it really, you can turn through them and, and, you, and you learn well pretty quickly. So I encourage everybody to work with it, and I'll do a demo at the end. The machine learning process is, is pretty basic, it's pretty standard, but it kind of follows this flow almost all the time. You, you ingest your data, you clean and transform your data, then you model, you train your data, this is where you start to apply this technique, and then you, you hold out some, some of your data, you train that algorithm with a portion of your data, and you hold out a test and, and cross-validation data set, then you run your error rate against that to see how, how good your model is to make predictions, and based on that, once you kind of iterate through that process, you find a good error rate, you then deploy that model in production for new data to come in and make predictions. It's kind of the process, it is the process for machine learning. So, you know, I, I really thought about a lot, like, where's the future of data science? And, you know, I've talked to a few colleagues and went through this, and to really understand the future, you kind of have to understand the past. And I thought, you know, data science is a concept that's been around a long time. I, I created this on the plane because I was trying to put my thoughts on paper. Um, but basically, if you think back of any innovation that happens from the calculator, in the 1700s, it was a mechanical calculator. It didn't really create innovation until we had the digital calculators, portable. We could all cheat on our classroom school stuff in the 80s. So that, that's when innovation happened. Then the next thing really came around was a spreadsheet. I mean, spreadsheets were created in the 60s, but until PCs caught up, and we all had desktops and Windows and Excel and so on, that began to transform how businesses kind of did their ledgers and managed their inventory and, and so on. And then the next thing was SQL, really was a database, a relational database was created. Well, SQL was created in the 70s, then it, that, that didn't really in, create a lot of innovation until the relational database came around and object-oriented development became massive and all, every business was building their own applications. Well, now we're in the era of machine learning. And um, this has been around a while, but, but open source is really democratizing machine learning. And that's the future, which is where machine learning becomes democratized and in, available to every business user, every application, and it's just a na natural part of what you're doing. From your CRM, when you put um, your customer information to a CRM, it automatically will build a model and train and tell you things back that you may not know. This is kind of, this is the future of data science and, um, and obviously AI, which is pretty important right now. Um, I consider AI really machine learning with context. It's something that's been trained and proven and, and interactive and you don't have to really know anything about it. It kind of handles itself. But AI is really an, an element of machine learning. Well, actually, machine learning is an element of AI, and um, we're doing quite a bit of work there. But, but artificial intelligence is kind of, I think of it as the next, you know, machine learning we're in now. Artificial intelligence is the compilation of a lot of machine learning that's going to happen over time forward down the road. If there's any questions, please ask. So to my point, the future of data science is really around democratizing machine learning. It's taking machine learning, making it part of every engineering project, making it part of every research project, making it part of our day, daily lives, whether it's a digital application that you put out for your customers, a web browser application, whatever you build, machine learning is kind of incorporated, embedded, and, and easy to implement, um, where you don't have to be a 
data scientists, or actually you could say you're a data scientist, but it's, it's simplified in a way that, that could be done. Um, that's kind of the approach, uh, that's the, my thought on the future of uh, machine learning and AI. So let's talk a little bit about an example of machine learning. So here's a, these are just some uh, shiny dashboards, Jupyter notebooks, um, and, and um, that I wanted to talk about, and I can actually demo this. But there's a lot of co uh, tools here. You have SkyKit Learn, which is a machine learning. You have Jupyter, you got Spark, you have Shiny um, and R, all brought together to really build this new model, which is uh, to take in a bunch of variables of, of properties in New York City and um, determine how efficient the buildings are. So it's gonna train a model by story, number of stories, the plug, number of plugs, um, square footage, a lot of different features. And then you train that model based on the power consumption and you can create a prediction model to say, based on diff these, these features, I can predict what the power usage is gonna be. So it's pretty basic, uh, very effective to the tool and makes it very nice and, and easy to share. But, but really putting this in action is kind of now let's take that model that we built and let's go ahead and democratize it by putting it in front, of, put a chatbot application in front of it. This is where you take, you know, some of those cognitive capabilities um, embedded with your own model that you built. And now you could take an image of a picture of a building and based on an image, you can use some libraries that could parse it and come back and say, this is how, uh, how many square feet we think the building is, it's an estimate, how many windows, and so on, and it can actually give you an estimate back in that chatbot of what um, the energy efficiency of your building would be. And we, we, you know, we've working on this with one of our partners, and uh, it's just a, a way I wanted to bring it up because it's just a new way of thinking, how do I apply machine learning to, you know, to make it something usable by everybody. Well, I would love to have a real estate app when I'm shopping for property and say, hey, I'm gonna take a picture of this. What is my electric bill gonna be? Because I know that real estate agent always tells me it's really cheap. And in Florida, electric bills are like 600 bucks. So I just was just saying it's, it would be nice if I had this in Florida. <laughs> but it's just a, a new way to, to kind of take those models. So let's talk a little bit about technology. So data science technology trends. So data science technologies have been out there for a while. These are some known platforms, our IBM's SPSS, which is white, very mature, SAS, Python, R, and Scala, open source. I kind of pulled a, a Google Trends together, and um, I'm not saying this is market share, don't get me wrong, this is really just searches on Google, but as you can see, the interest in Python and R are through the roof compared to the other packages. And um, this, wherever there's interest and uh, there's community, there's innovation. So at IBM, we're actually embracing this technology in, in our data science experience, which I think a lot of you saw in the keynote. Data science is, is really driving uh, the database to big data evolution, the use of data science at scale. And as you can see, uh, I did the same search on Google Trends and database to big data. Big data kind of passed in 2013. But then if you look at Hadoop versus Spark, Spark is just skyrocketed. Um, and there's, there's a lot of reasons why Spark um, is, is, is very, very good right now for data science workload. I'm, I don't know if I covered it. Oh yeah, here we go. So um, the convergence of big data and open source technologies, as you can see, Spark's in the middle, but the ability to start to pull your R capabilities, Shiny, R Studio, and as well as Python. There's a lot of things in Python from SkyKit Learn and other you know, different libraries. Together, Spark is kind of pulling all that together. And Spark's really good for data science workload because of you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the DAG or the, the, uh, the way the engines work. Uh, it's all in memory, it's not a database. I have a more detail I was gonna go over with Spark, but um, I think everybody here knows Spark. How many people know what Spark is? Kind of, yeah, yeah, so good, I'm glad I took it out. <laughs> so everybody's good with Spark. But, um, so IBM, we're, we're all in on Spark. Um, last year we created the Spark Technology Center, which really allows us to contribute it, uh, to Spark. And if you want more in information on that, you go to spark.tc. But we really invest in three areas. So first, 
community. We contribute a lot to community. We foster community, meaning we have educational uh, activities. And then we infuse our portfolio. So uh, every application we build really uses Spark. I mean, that's the reason we contribute so heavily. Um, Spark is under cover, you know, Spark's being used by Watson. So um, we use Spark heavily. And if you look at the areas we're contributing to Spark, uh, it's really around data science. I mean, our top three areas that we're contributing is machine learning, ML libraries, the PySpark, which is you know, incorporating Python, the Python community into uh, distributed, and then SQL, which you know I showed you before. SQL is kind of the his history of data science, in my opinion. And uh, so it's really the IBM's direction is around machine, uh, around data science. And if you look at our contributions to Spark ML uh, and ML Lib. And in here we have a system ML. You know, we, we are heavily driving, between Hortonworks and us, we have half the contributions in machine learning capabilities within Spark and in the community. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our data science experience platform and um, what it is. So IBM Data Science Experience is an environment that brings together everything that a data scientist needs to be more productive, including the tools, data, content, and to, you know, to, to really be a better data scientist. So we're trying to simplify that. And we, there was a lot of announcement in the keynote. If you go to datascience.ibm.com, please sign up for a free trial. Over here, we got Luis, who's the senior offer manager. <laughs> if you have questions afterwards, come see me or him, and we can uh, definitely help you with, uh, with more about the platform. A little bit more detail about the platform, IBM Data Science Experience. Is a, is a platform that helps you learn. Uh, you know, we have a place for community where you can um, have notebooks and uh, tutorials that you can learn from. It also a place for you to create, I almost call it like a maker space. It's a place that you can create a lot of notebooks, share those notebooks with your colleagues and collaborate on them. So it's really cool. And you know, some of the tools in there, you have Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio, Shiny, Apache Spark, all built into the platform. Um, it, and and um, I can tell you this much, me and my colleagues, many times I create a notebook, I'll pull in a TensorFlow library, say, I'll create a cool style transfer, and then I'll share it with like 10 guys, and next thing you know, they're in there, and, and they're working with it, and they're sharing it. So it's, it's, it was, it's very effective internally. We just went GA late last year, and we've had a ton of interest. So I recommend everybody check it out, and, and we really believe in a bottom-up you know, way of, of selling, just, just go use it, go play with it, and if you really want to embrace it in the organization, we can help you make that happen. So, you know, open source is a, so Spark and open source is really a powerful engine, and, and, and but, you know, if I got a, a, a cool sports car engine, there's really not much I could do with it without the wheels, the steering wheel, so you could build all those things yourself, you know, if you want to, do all your hosting, you could, you want security, you can handle it yourself, you know, version concurrency and, and data connectivity and scalability, that can all be built yourself, but our point with DSX is like, don't bother building that, bother on leveraging that engine to drive really fast, which I like to do. Notebooks are, for people that don't know, notebooks are browser-based interactive collaborative, uh, uh, it's almost like an IDE for data scientists is what I consider it. It's a space where you can create a, a cell, write some code, it gives you back results, and you can interact. And I think back, you know, years ago, people had notebooks and pen and paper, and they would write formulas, and they would jot down graphs. Now it's all done digitally. So that's kind of what notebooks are. And it's almost like a collection of, of, of your company's assets there where somebody's trying to solve a problem, they're putting it down and documenting that. And it's actually become a way with DSX for our clients they kind of uh, use these notebooks as a way to document and share uh, some of the problem solving and things they're trying to do. So within DSX, we have really three areas that we kind of managed everything around. We're managing uh, around people. This is where we create projects and we add collaborators and give access control. We have manage around artifacts. This is where we build visual capabilities of flows of data pipelines from machine learning models to notebooks, and then data. This is where we bring data sets together, organize those. So that's kind of the meet three, meet main three areas that our data science experience uses. So um, 
in, in a lot of ways, when you have a data science project, it, it's if you, if you think about a, a surgery, uh, most there's a bunch of people in there. They're all participating to perform a surgery. Whether somebody's prepping there, the the, the uh, uh, area for the surgery to the guy that's kind of starting the incision, and then the specialty comes in and he just kind of replaces the heart or whatever the surgery is. Um, same with data science. You know, you have different people that have different skill levels, but they can all participate to solve that one complex data science problem. And, um, and we feel the platform that we've built really uh, kind of enables that. I want to talk a little bit about DSX is a, is a collection of multiple things. We talked about Apache Spark. It's kind of the, the heart and engine of it. Notebooks is really the um, vehicle for managing, but as well, R Studio, and we have Shiny. But we also have built our Watson Machine Learning. This is the ability for us to uh, build models and to manage the auto-generation of models, the deployment of models, create simple endpoints, uh, using Apache Spark, but as well other algorithms. So it's a it's a it's a way for you now to use um, to build a, build your model, train it, and deploy it all within the tool. You don't have to have a separate project anymore. I can tell you, in my my old job, I had SaaS developers, a SaaS data scientist, who would build a model. Then I had a bunch of Python developers who would rewrite what was built in SaaS to put in our digital applications, it was very inefficient. I got the board to give me a bunch of money and I put out a project, a big data project, and we were able to automate a lot of that, but it's still very manual. You know, it was, it was difficult to do. Um, solving this problem in one platform where it's a one-click deployment, which I'll show you what that looks like, uh, is very powerful. And then on top of that, we're adding, and this is still in beta, but it's gonna be released here soon. On top of that, we're adding the ability for, for it to self, you know, have a feedback loop and it can monitor itself. And you set KPIs and say if it's kind of out of your, your error rate or, or what and give you alerts. So there's quite a bit of work going into this space. We're also incorporating a full range of Watson Cognitive Services. These are things like tone analyzer. So when you, when you parse in text, it can tell you back tone. Uh, we have a ton of, of APIs that you can incorporate inside DSX so the data scientist doesn't have to build it himself. Um, there's a lot of value in this and we're, getting, we're having a lot of success, whether it's around language, speech, vision, or, or data insights. We have a lot of APIs that are available um, to the data scientists. So we've been recognized for our vision. Uh, whether it's Gardner, really recently on February, they put us in the upper right quadrant for data science platforms. Uh, Forrester Wave, we're, we're up there, and then um, Developer Week 2017. So we've had a lot of, of, a lot of positive um, um, feedback from the analyst community, so hopefully we're on the right path. So I'm gonna now do a demo. Uh, before I do a demo, is there any questions? No questions? All right. So this is our, uh, this is data science experience. So anyone can go to datascience.ibm.com and um, you know, it, it bring you here. So if, you're not, if you haven't signed up, please do sign up and you get a, it's free to use. When you land into DSX, you'll see it's a combination of your community, which is, these are what we call content cards. So if you wanted to um, find an article on different things, you can explore community um, by going right here, and we have tutorials on Spark and all kinds of stuff out there. For some of our more um, other, for our bigger clients, we're working with them on having their own way of creating their content. I found this to be, a lot of our larger clients have data science teams, are really interested in this because they're able to kind of organize their work and publish it internally, and then they can share it. And so for example, Inside DSX, you can pull up some of these content cards in your notebook and just for, you know, bring the code right into your project. So it's kind of a cool um, way for folks, to, data scientists, to document their work. Uh, then we also have projects, which you'll see here, but projects are kind of up here. And if you view all projects, this is how we kind of organize the work that's being done. Um, I'll just bring one up here, machine learning in five minutes. But you'll see once you bring up this project, it's a combination of analytic assets which has notebooks, these are models, machine learning models, and flows. Flows are 
um, um, at like a canvas. This is all, this kind of, the bottom's beta, I'm beta, but it's like SPSS, uh, a visual drag and drop way of building some flows. Uh, data assets, this is a kind of organizing your data. Um, and then we have bookmarks. This is some of the articles that might be relevant. Deployments, these are de um, deployed uh, models that are actually persisted out there that, at, you know, as we go to production with some of this, you'll see some stats on it. But these are where, this is a REST API that you basically built and you, you created that could be evoked by digital apps. And then collaborators, so this you can see here, you know, I have some folks on here are editors, I'm the admin, so you can have different levels of access. And then settings, which shows the project name, you know, storage being used, associated services, we have a, a Spark service, a machine learning service, uh, tokens, and then GitHub integration. So there's quite a bit of, of, uh, of integration here, things that you know and love. Um, so let me just show you real quick of, of how you would create a model, sorry. The other thing to keep in mind is, is up here you have some data services. You can create connections to external data sources. It kind of organizes that for you. You can load data in. You can just drag data in right here, actually, on the control panel. This is where I do a lot of work on the right. Um, and then data services. So you have, I said that, tools. You have RStudio notebooks. Um, and then projects we have here, machine learning. So let me show you what a, a machine learning model, how easy it is to create one. So I'm gonna go to analytic assets. And right here I have two models. One's trained, so it's already been trained, and the other one's untrained. I'm gonna show you the untrained so that you can see what this looks like. So it's a simple GUI um, that basically goes through a pipeline process, which you guys can't see. It looks like it's cut off. Sorry. Somebody has to yell at me when they're talking. All right, here we go. Can you guys see that? So as you can see on the left, uh, it's basically select data, prep data, train data. It's the steps that we talked about from creating a machine learning model. So here you would just pick one of these data sets that I dragged in. Uh, you go to prep and you can basically see the data. So this has product line, gender, age, marital status, and profession. You can add some transformers to that data if you want to. So you can do some vectorizing of data. You can, um, you know, you can use binary. You know, you, you have a lot of different um, components here. In, you know, index to string, use that a lot, or min, maximize, scalar. So you have a, quite a bit of stuff you can use, which is, doesn't require coding if you don't want to use coding. Um, here you can then train. Basically, what you do is, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make it big, but also not so ugly. So here you pick your predictor field. So I want to predict product line and then features that I'm going to base it on, the model I'm going to train against. So you just basically all of them's default. Um, it'll recommend uh, approach, so multi-class classification. And then here you can pick your estimators. So I have a random forest. And um, then you can define how much you want to, uh, how much of the data you want to train or versus test and hold out. So uh, one of the things here is that, you know, in, typically a data scientist, you have to code all this, and I'll show you what the code version looks like. Here it's a GUI for you, and it uses Spark ML right now behind the scenes. Uh, you can actually add uh, as many estimators as you want. I just happen to have one in there random for us. Typically I grabbed all, but um, then here you can do evaluate, and you'll see now the results didn't come back great as I just did this earlier, but 57% uh, accurate is better than flipping a coin. And then once you get to the point you want, you, you really just save this. And what that will look like is it'll save that model back into our service that you can then use to create a deployment. So here I have a train model. And what you can see is basically it's saying that here's the, uh, the service that is holding it. It's product, the predictor field's product line. It's using a random forest classification uh, for part of Spark ML. You can see the data schema here that it was trained against, as well as the input data. So you have gender, age, marital status, profession. And um, then simply, uh, see, it's, I just trained this today. Just like spin it here. I think my, but um, here we go. 
But the deployments right here, once this comes up, I think my Wi-Fi is slow, will show you that you have the ability to just do a one-click deployment. Let me try this again. And then once it's deployed, right here you'll see, you'll have a deployment. Here we go. And this deployment is active, um, and basically it has a REST API that is, can be invoked by a digital application. And if you come here, you'll see this is just a Node.js app, which has that same data, which you'll see it's, uh, here's the active service, and, and here's some just sample people. So if I picked Gregory and did a generated prediction, it'll give me back results a 74%, 77% likely to do golf equipment. So that REST API can be really used by any digital app, um, and you can easily build it within the tool uh, for, for data science experience. A couple of things I wanted to show in data science experience is we have RStudio integrated, and um, it has the ability to create shiny apps. So here you can see, uh, let me find it, here we go. my projects. All right, here we go. But I was going to show you the notebooks as well. So here in my project, I have a bunch of notebooks. And um, I'm going to bring up the uh, Spark ML. So this is, a, this is what your Spark model would look like if you had to code it with that same data. You know, you'd have, uh, it's really a bunch of Python code. So you would have to you know, bring the data set in. The one thing that's nice about data science experience is that you can easily um, dra drag and drop data into your environment. So as you can see now, I'm going into edit mode. So I now have edit access. I can create a new, new, new field and automatically my Spark context is available. So you don't have to connect to a Spark cluster. It's already pre-configured with, with it. Um, you can go here on the right. This is kind of our control panel. You'll see here's some data sets, so I can insert code. I can quickly insert a, a Spark session data frame, and it'll automatically generate the code for you, so you don't have to generate. So it's got a lot of these value adds. Up on the top here, you'll see we have the ability to schedule this notebook, so you can schedule to run on an interval basis. Um, and then here you have chat capability, so I can add comments, and we can share it amongst the teams. Um, here you have version control, so you can add and save versions of the different notebooks. Here's the information of the, the uh, notebook, as well as environment. And as you can see, your environment has um, you know, NumPy, SciPy, it's got pandas. All of your Python libraries are pre-installed, matplotlib, which most people use a lot. Brunel I use quite a bit. Um, you have that scheduling capability, and you could share this notebook with anyone. Uh, so it's got, it gives you quite a bit of, of, of things that typically in the past, and then the other thing that's nice is you can push this to GitHub if you want to publish it or publish a GIST. So it's all pretty cool stuff. Um, but, but again, it's a combination of giving you all the tools that you know and love if you're a coder, as well as visual tool for people that don't want to code so much. So I, I think um, that's really, unless, you, is there anything else that you guys wanted to, talk about the one other thing um here let me see here is there any questions i really need a question somebody's got to have a question all right good thank god yeah yeah so it, 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 there's an automatic feature, so when you build a new model, now to get, keep in mind this is still in beta, so, uh, but when I build a new model here, the automatic feature I believe handles those, those blank ones. So I've added a model, it's very simple, and uh, test, you can see the, the option here is automatic or manual. When you pick automatic, it will pre-prep the data for you so that if you have five features and you know you pick which predictor field, but uh, it'll just automatically handle those things. It makes it a lot easier. We're working out the, the, the details of that, but um, a lot of people are pretty happy with it.
Good question. Yes. Yeah, we, we are working, so if you're an SPSS, the question was, is it possible to transform existing models with SPSS? So we're working on the SPSS uh, in integration. Um, the idea is we're gonna pull, right now we have Spark ML, we're gonna bring some of the SPSS models into the machine learning capability, but as well we have something that's still in beta, and I don't know if I could show it, but I'm gonna show it anyway. This is the, what a flow looks like, and this is for the folks that don't want to code um, but want to use a nice visualization. Um, it brings in this um, ability to create these, I'm not an SPSS guy, but to create these uh, flows. As you can see here, it's just drag and drop. You can do a data select or user input and kind of build your, your flow out as well as try to run some of the existing SPSS desktop uh, versions in this tool. Good question. Any other question? This, this is beta, I probably shouldn't show this, but um, th this is mostly using the SPSS models, um, but I think on, there's a lot of integration that covers with Spark, so there's some capabilities in there, Spark. Spark ML is really the, uh, the Spark's the engine underneath the covers. And the other thing too is pretty cool is the data, uh, data right here, we have this, we're working on data management capabilities and uh, what this does is, is a way for you to, a lot of data scientists bring data in and get it under management and, and just part of using the platform, it, it kind of creates this capability of catalogs, um, which is, uh, is also beta, but I, I don't know. But it's basically a nice way to see recently accessed data assets as well as easy ways to pivot the data. So this is all things coming that we're working on. But I want you to focus on the data science experience part. So please, everybody, let me get back to this. I want to show you something real quick before you guys leave. If you want to get started with data science experience, um, you can go to uh, datascience.ibm.com. Uh, we have desktop version. You can download and load on, for desktop and local. But just sign up for DSX. And then we have a bunch of GitHub repositories, which you know, the, the New York City ones right there uh, uh, for the, the energy model that I showed. And you know what, uh, uh, take a, I'll, this will be available for download so you guys can all get to it. And you could really play with those projects. But the, the model that I, I, I apologize, I jumped off. Um, here's what the uh, Shiny app looks like. So this was that notebook that we trained with the energy consumption that I showed you. So this is an interactive dashboard built out of our studio with Shiny, and it allows you to kind of interact with the data. And you can see here, these are all your observations. Uh, the cluster analysis kind of shows which ones are green, which are energy efficient. The reds, based on the model, are not efficient, kind of your outliers. And then your predictive model here is based on number of stories, um, square footage, and it kind of gives you energy consumption. So this is a nice way to actually use some of the open source tools inside of DSX to create a, a, a nice dashboard. I think I'm almost out of time, right? Um, how many, any more questions? Any last questions? If you guys want, you can come up and say, thank you very much for coming to see us. Thanks. <laughs>